Good afternoon, everyone. Bear with me a little bit. I'm a little brain fried today. I've been up since about six this morning trying to deal with a bunch of stuff. So um, if I'm a little bit more scatterbrained than usual, just let me know. Um, a couple of things I kind of want to do my typical like morning reminders or whatever. Remember that quiz four is due uh, this upcoming Sunday at 11.59 p.m. It'll be over the three lectures that we have this week. Um, shouldn't be anything too crazy. Uh, these first three lectures of this unit are relatively easier compared to what we're going to be getting into later. Um, one thing I do want to warn you about, and it's something that you should probably start planning ahead of time because this is something that's going to make the next test a lot more difficult. Uh, but it's not a deal breaker. It's not hard if you start studying now. Let's put it that way. Um, a lot of this upcoming exam is going to have a lot of just straight up memorization. Um, so I know that obviously that first unit was a lot more like big concept heavy. This one is a lot more uh, memorization and remembering, you know, what part of the immune system, the intestines, the all that kind of fun stuff and how that all fits together. So you're going to probably want to start as early as you possibly can doing note cards and that sort of thing. So you can start memorizing those very specific functions. A lot of the stuff you'll probably have already heard when it comes to, you know, uh, different parts of the digestive system or the respiratory system or whatever. But we go into a little bit more detail than you probably did in high school. And those details do matter. So just keep that in the back of your mind. As for the test last Friday, seems like a lot of y'all felt fairly comfortable with it. I saw a lot of people finish in like 15 minutes, which is good. I'd rather have y'all finish early because I gave you two little questions than struggle and be here till like 10 minutes after the test. So um, sorry, it took us a while to pick up all the tests with only two of us, you know, it's, it's a process. Um, but for those of you that did not have your ID, don't forget to stop by up here uh, up front and remind me to just double check it. Uh, if you don't have it today, bring it Wednesday. Um, but at some point you do need to show me your ID. I did keep track of who did and who did have it on uh, Friday. Another thing to keep in mind too is unfortunately, it'll probably be till Monday before I can release the grades because I'm still waiting on tests from SAS. Plus there are 45 students out of 450, so roughly 10% that had to miss for an excused absence. That is the highest I've ever seen. All but four of them were COVID related. So please keep that in mind. Please be careful when you're around here on campus. Yeah, you're not like getting sick and more than likely at your age, you're not going to get sick and die, right? But you can spread it to other people as well as you know, you're gonna be locked in your room for two weeks and you'll be told you cannot come to class. And so if you really don't like online classes, it is what it is. So just keep that in mind. Obviously, you can't avoid everything 100%. I don't become a hermit, but at the same time, try to be a little bit careful. Um, with that being said, um, as you may have noticed, starting last Wednesday, I made available to everyone the uh, link for the YouTube channel that I post all of these lectures on. Feel free to take advantage of that. I highly encourage not just fo purely focusing on that, actually come to lecture. It usually helps one, because you're gonna pay attention a lot more because you know, you're here, you're physically in my presence, whatever. So if I see y'all just goofing off, I can give you a hard time. But the other big reason why it might be important is there's gonna be times where I step away from the board or start pointing stuff out and that's not necessarily gonna get caught as well on the recording. And I don't have an entire AV production team. It's just me with my computer up here. So they're not the best recorded quality in the world. So don't rely on this as your only way of getting stuff unless you absolutely have to. It's there for those that can't make it to lecture for X, Y, Z reasons that are usually excused. Um, just don't use it as a crutch. With that being said, does anybody have any questions before we get started on today's lecture? And again, if you, especially once I get your grades back for the previous exam, um, let me know if you want to review them during office hours or something like that. Most of the questions are pretty straightforward, so it's pretty easy to figure out why you might have gotten something wrong, but 
if you do have any questions, there's always office hours. I know today I had to cancel it, but normally it's Monday and Wednesday. And if you can't make those times, don't hesitate to reach out to me by email and we can schedule another time. I promise I do whatever I can to like make time for y'all. Because as far as I'm concerned, y'all are paying a lot of money to be here. And while UCF isn't great all the time about, you know, trying to give the quality education to their students, uh, I do what I can. So there's obviously things that are put on me as far as like what I can and can't do, especially with things like excused absences. It's not something in my control, but I do whatever I can to try to give you all as the fair shake as possible in here. So just keep that in mind. There's some times where I'm just not going to be able to do things, but for the most part, I'll do everything I can to advocate for y'all. So let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be jumping back into uh, our second unit and we're gonna be jumping to chapter 15, which is the evolution and diversity of microbial life. So that, you know, right at the tail end of unit one, we talked about what is a cell? What are the different things that make up a cell? Now we're gonna actually talk about, now that we know what a cell is, what are the different kinds of cells? Um, everything from a single celled organism that's going to exist on its own, to looking at the different kinds of cells and multicellular organisms. Now, remember back, we've kind of talked about this a couple of times. Um, we're not entirely certain where the origin of life came from. And it's extremely difficult to pinpoint where life on earth began. Our best guess is somewhere around four to five billion years ago. I think a lot of people usually say about 4.6 based off of the fossils that we have and all that kind of fun stuff. But after a certain period of time, it becomes really difficult to you know, have fossils because either the rocks are going to change or when you're talking about a single celled organism, we barely get things as mar massive as like large dinosaurs, right? Things that were a hundred feet long. We're lucky if we get maybe a percent or like a, a single percent of that to fossilize. Imagine what it's like for bacterium or fungi or something like that, totally different. Now, one thing we do know is that the first cells were likely prokaryotic, which means that, again, they didn't have a nucleus. They were just kind of cytoplasm filled jelly bags that were able to sustain life on their own. But later on, I believe it's around 2 billion years ago, you start seeing eukaryotes start to show up. Now, early Earth wasn't exactly super hospitable to life. It was kind of a barren landscape. There wasn't the oxygen concentration that we talked about. Remember, that kind of came around when we got a lot of photosynthesizing plants, um, as well as up until, I think the reason why we believe around that 4 billion years mark is where the, what is thought to be the precursor to the moon ran into earth and then split off and half of it became part of uh, what actually became what we know as the moon now, and the rest of it got incorporated into earth. And that initial uh, impact is what actually helped to drive and shape what the earth looks like so it could actually start facilitating life. Another, uh, one of the big things that in particular, hmm? uh, but one of the big things that were kind of inhibiting uh, life at this time is specifically the pressure and the temperatures were extremely hot and extremely high pressure. So you're not going to be able to maintain an atmosphere for something to live in. This is kind of what you see right now in Mars or Venus, where you have very hot temperatures, very cold temperatures, as well as very toxic and low pressure uh, atmospheres that don't hold in gases very well. Now, life probably started with very simple chemicals. Now, Earth's early atmosphere included things like methane, ammonia, water, and hydrogen, likely given off through volcanic reactions and stuff of that sort, similar to the atmospheres of other planets today. Um, Venus in particular, it's, it's almost its entire atmosphere is made up of methane. So methane isn't necessarily just a biologically generated chemical. But um, once it was kind of being able to be accessed by life, it started being able to be used for that and ultimately be able to use for a lot of different things. Now, organic molecules formed from these simple chemicals. So in the Miller experiment, which you may want to pay attention to that, um, scientists applied electricity to what we call a, a, a rough soup, if you will, of simple chemicals that made up Earth's early atmosphere. If you're able to find a paper on this experiment and you want to use the good soup thing from TikTok, this would be a good one to do. Um, 
Chemicals were then combined to form organic molecules just because they were you know, run through with electricity and it just kind of happened naturally. And that's what generated some basic nucleotides and amino acids. However, this didn't generate life. We've yet to be able to ever do that. So while we have an idea of how this might have helped to generate some of those things, it's not a complete picture of how life arrived. Now remember back to these macromolecules are the building blocks of cells. Without them, you cannot have life. And so you, you needed these organic monomer, monomers to join together in chains to form these large macromolecules, such as nucleic acids, proteins, and polysaccharides. And the clay surface of the earth may have helped with this. So the clay and the iron pyrite that was kind of most of earth's surface, particularly around where areas where water was, uh, may have helped to create the right conditions for that first synthesis reaction, forming RNA with sunlight providing energy. But again, this is just highly speculative. We're not really sure. And it ultimately resulted in an RNA world where we may have seen that's how life started. So RNA began self-replicating as its own molecule. And once it formed and replicated, natural selection kind of took over. And that's why even in things like viruses, which aren't considered life, they could still be entirely RNA-based and evolve over time. So there may have been this kind of weird intermediary period where you don't quite have their first bacterial cell, but there's something kind of in between. Ultimately, stable molecules that could self-replicate became more and more common. And eventually these membranes would enclose these molecules. So the phospholipid bilayer that we talked about would naturally arrange themselves into that bilayer structure. And some of these self-replicating RNA molecules became enclosed in that phospholipid bilayer. And that's when we're going to get our first very simple cell, which was just simply self-replicating molecules surrounded by a membrane. And thus, this is why like prokaryotes are very, very basic, and these are probably like the most basic of basic prokaryotes. Yeah. So he asked if it's not quite life yet, how is it self-replicating? Um, so that's only part of the explanation of what is life. So if it's not able to maintain homeostasis yet, then it's not considered life 100%. It's one of those like five things that we went over in that like second lecture. And that's why one of the reasons why we don't consider viruses to be is because they can't, or while they can't self-replicate, um, they don't maintain homeostasis either. Hope that makes a little bit more sense. Now, early life on earth did not use oxygen. This is more of a recent trend and is kind of related to the advent of photosynthesis on the Earth. But um, it basically was because the Earth's atmosphere really didn't have any oxygen. So everything was very strictly anaerobic. So cellular respiration, a lot of that stuff was very much more inefficient. And you had to rely on other chemicals to be able to get those kind of processes to happen. The first cells that appear in the Hadeon era were likely the first to use organic molecules as a source of carbon and energy. They were likely what we call nowadays uh, chemoautotrophs. So they were using chemicals and either some sort of reaction to break them down and gather energy that way. Ultimately, oxygen came from photosynthesis. So around 3.5 billion years ago, cells, probably aquatic bacteria or archaea, began to use energy from the sunlight and obtain carbon from CO2 in the air. This photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis then released oxygen as a waste product, which spiked the amount of oxygen in the environment and kind of helped build it up in the atmosphere to where what was once almost 0%, now is somewhere between 20 to 22%, depending on where you're at and how far up you are in elevation, that kind of thing. Now, this photosynthesis ultimately changed Earth forever because the CO2 levels plunged as it was being used as a reactant while oxygen began to accumulate as a product of photosynthesis. And this permanently altered the composition of the atmosphere. And that's why it's kind of important to think about in context of modern day, where we have excess carbon dioxide being put into the environment. That's not necessarily the end of the world. Honestly, Earth will probably go on without us, even if we kill ourselves off. But the thing to keep in mind here is that maybe we can use these similar kinds of processes to then kind of be corrupted and be used for our own purposes so that way we can turn CO2 back into oxygen and not have that high concentration of CO2 that ultimately is resulting in the different climate patterns and stuff like that. Just some things to think about. So here's a quick review question. 
What was the Miller experiment? I think it's A, B, C, D. Yeah, it's D. Um, it demonstrated that Earth's early atmosphere could have not or could have given rise to organic molecules by basically taking that soup of things together and running electricity through it, like you would see through lightning storms. So what exactly is a prokaryote? We've thrown that term around a lot, but let's try to define it a little bit more narrowly. So prokaryotes are a single-celled organism that lack both a nucleus and a membrane-bound organelles. So things like mitochondria or chloroplasts. Prokaryotes range in size from about one to 10 micrometers long, which is super stupid tiny, um, which is most, which is much more smaller than most eukaryotic cells. Um, this is gonna be a situation where instead of being able to see it at one or even 10 or 15 times, you know, normal eyes, eye power, if you're looking through a microscope, you're gonna have to go to a hundred or even a thousand times so you can see them. Now, prokaryotes are an interesting biological success story. They've been living on Earth for billions of years, ever since the earliest known cells evolved, but they've yet to be replaced, right? There's not something, it's not like they just disappeared, because there's a lot of dead ends in evolution, right? You think of things like trilobites, there's nothing like that that exists on the Earth anymore. Dinosaurs, right? Yeah, we still have birds, but they're pretty much all gone and been replaced by kind of mammal equivalents. All that kind of stuff happens all the time, you know? There were once alligators and crocodiles that could stand six feet tall on, and like run as fast as like a, about 30 or 40 miles an hour. But they all died out because that niche disappeared. But this back, or, but prokaryotes are really interesting because they've been able to just withstand all of those changes for the last 4 billion years, which is incredible. But today we have kind of two groups of prokaryotes, which are divided into the bacteria, which are kind of the earliest versions of prokaryotes, and then archaea which is kind of ironic considering archaea sounds ancient, right? But it's actually a little bit more derived than traditional prokaryotes or traditional bacteria. Now prokaryotes vastly outnumber eukaryotes. So in recent years, DNA of analysis has helped biologists identify thousands of unknown species. And honestly, I'll be real with you, species concepts don't really work with prokaryotes. They're just too varied and too different. It makes it really difficult. Thus, it's becoming really clear that there are thousands, maybe millions more left to discover. In fact, there's entire programs that are in places like Great Smoky Mountains National Park or Everglades National Park, where all they do is they go out, collect a scoop of water or a scoop of dirt, and then try to or culture and colonize these little, you know, tiny bacterial colonies, and then do genetic sequencing of them, just to try to see what they are. And it, it doesn't always work very well, but... I did it as a part of a program on my master's just for a class. And we discovered just in this class alone, over the course of a semester, 10 new species that have never been seen before to science. It just happens all the time. Now, bacteria and archaea are very different despite being both prokaryotes. Their DNA sequences, their chemical compositions are ultimately going to be what's used to tell these two to remain apart. And because outwardly, these organisms can appear quite similar. So molecular and biochemically, archaea share more features with eukaryotes and bacteria. That's why I'm saying they're kind of more derived than the traditional bacteria. So this can make it very, very difficult to classify prokaryotes. Ultimately, you have to use a lot of microscope tests or laboratory tests, but it seems like DNA sequencing, if you can get them to get volumes of DNA high enough that you can actually do anything with it, are probably your best way to go about those. Now, bacteria and archaea have very similar internal structure. You have the nucleoid, which is a region where the DNA resides. So it's not just unprotected floating around in the cytoplasm. It does have a little bit of a generalized region where it's going to stay. It's just not membrane bound. You then have ribosomes that are going to uh, float through the cytoplasm and be used to um, synthesize protein through mRNA. And then you have the plasmid, which is a circle of DNA apart from the chromosome itself. You can actually use these to speed up evolution to some extent, because these plasmids are able to move between different individuals of bacteria as kind of almost like a, a pseudo version of sexual re reproduction, where they're able to swap genes between each other. 
Now, we also have very similar external structures, where, of course, many bacteria and archaea have the classic cell membrane, uh, where it can either regulate what comes in and out of the cell or help to, you know, be as attachment points for various uh, structures like cilia or flagella, as well as many also have a cell wall, which is outside of the mem membrane, and it gives that cell its shape and helps protect it from losing osmotic pressure. So in other words, it helps keep water regulation a lot more uh, developed. Now, some prokaryotes have structures called plae, and plae are these short hair-like projections made of protein, and these are going to what allow these cells to adhere to surfaces or to other cells itself. So that's how you can actually get those little bacterial colonies. If you've ever like a uh, classic activity, if you're ever bored, get what, like a simple Petri dish, put a little bit of like solution in it that's designed to grow bacteria on it and just take a little Q-tip and like rub it on a door handle or your phone. You'd be just, you'd be kind of disgusted to see what all comes back. Just keep that in mind. But additionally, there's other external structures, like things like flagella, which are these long tail-like structures. Um, they're super long and whip-like, and by rotating them using a specialized protein, it helps almost act like a propeller so they can propel the cell through the whatever media it's existing on. Now, cell walls are gonna ultimately determine what shape a bacterium is going to take, or archaea for that matter. There are three most common shapes for bacteria, which are the caucus or spherical, and you can see that right up top on the, um, the slide there. You have rod-shaped or bacillus and spirillum, which is spiral. Um, the spirillum should be pretty easy one to remember, but the other two you're probably just going to have to memorize. Additionally, on top of all this stuff, you have something called the endospore, which can help to keep bacteria alive. And this is actually kind of problematic because if you're trying to develop antibiotics or something like that, you need something that's going to penetrate into that endospore and be able to actually get into the internal mechanisms of that bacterial cell. So in particular, things like Clostridium botulinum, the thing that causes botulism that we've kind of corrupted a little bit to do things like uh, Botox. Uh, if you normally got this parasite it, or sorry, pathogen, it would really screw up your day and you would get weird. Think of like Botox, but on like a whole nother level, like half of your face would be completely deformed because it can't quite, you know, make those muscle or the electrical connections and all that stuff because of the buildup of botulinum toxin. Really cool stuff, kind of dark, but um, this particular bacterium has a specialized endospore that makes it really damn difficult to kill. It's going to be something that you're not going to necessarily see in everything, but it does influence in why this particular bacterium is able to hang around in particularly harsh environments. So scientists ultimately classify prokaryotes based off of metabolism, uh, or at least they used to do. Um, now, prokaryotes are amazingly diverse in how they obtain carbon and energy. Uh, obviously, you have your kind of typical autotroph versus heterotroph, an organism that acquires carbon through organic or inorganic sources or, organic, or by consuming some sort of other organism and getting the, or the organic molecules that way. And there's a couple different ways it can do be an autotroph. They can be a phototroph, so they're using light to generate that, or they can be a chemotroph, which is where the organism derives its energy from chemicals. You could also be an aerobe or an anaerobe. So those are organisms that use oxygen to produce ATP, or anaerobic, which is where they produce ATP without the presence of oxygen. And you can have a lot of different combinations of these, you know, kind of two broad or three broad categories. Now, aerobic prokaryotes require oxygen. The oxygen requirement is also very important, um, particularly for kind of determining how a particular bacterium might exist in the environment. Is, you know, if you're aerobic, you're probably going to have to have access to oxygen from somewhere. And if you're not able to maintain that, you're going to die off. So there's certain instances where you can almost kind of starve that particular bacterium and keep it from reproducing by cutting off the oxygen supply. Aerobic habitats like body surfaces and leaves uh, house obligate aerobes that would die without oxygen. However, with anaerobes, they would, um, obligate anaerobes mean they can't live with oxygen present at all. So they only live in habitats such as the digestive tract or deep down in the lake sediments where oxygen doesn't reach. And then you can get to facultative anaerobes, which is where 
They can live in either environment, but they tend to prefer aerobic just because that's a little bit easier for them to process materials. So kind of neat. Now, bacteria are extremely diverse. Thanks to DNA sequence analysis, as well, uh, we're able to better understand the evolutionary relationships among bacteria, as well as kind of grouping them compared to other forms of life, whether that be archaea or eukaryotes themselves. We have a couple of just general groups that we'll mention here. Things like the proteobacteria. Proto usually means early, so that's kind of the most basic. Um, and they're the most diverse group just because they probably existed very early on. And so it's allowed them more time to diverse or diversify compared to other organisms. Then you get things like cyanobacteria, which are photosynthesizers. Um, cyano is usually associated with uh, the color cyan. So kind of that bluish green color. Um, and then some can also cause, it, it, keep in mind too with bacteria, it's important to just remember that not all bacteria are harmful. But most aren't. It's like 99% will not do anything to you or other organisms. Is that 1% that kind of give bacteria and archaea their bad name? And those include things like anthrax, salmonella, syphilis, smallpox, um, and quite a few others. Uh, the botulism one that we just talked about, Giardia. There's a ton of these little bacterial cells that are, if they want to, they're designed to screw you up pretty good. However, there are many bacteria that are incredibly beneficial for both the ecology of a system as well as for human health. Um, if you've ever taken a really, you know, strong dose of antibiotics, it's often killed, it usually kills off the uh, gut microbes that you have inside of your small intestines, your large intestines and your stomach. And as a result of that, you may notice for about two to three weeks afterwards, it may be more difficult and you may have a lot more issues you know, dealing with milk or dealing with salads, that kind of stuff. Because it takes that bacteria to help break things down when you normally would have to rely on those bacteria, you don't have them at that point. There's actually really cool studies where, um, happening here on campus, where when SeaWorld rescues a manatee, they often have to give them antibiotics because more often than not, they're boat strike victims or something like that. And so they have pretty heavy loads of it just because they're big animals and it takes a lot to make sure that they can keep those wounds clean. But once they get them healthy, they now have a situation where those manatees don't have that gut bacteria that they need to break down all that seagrass. And so they've developed a remedy, if you will, where they kind of take the uh, feces from wild manatees and extract just the bacteria cells from it and are able to kind of create a slurry that then can go into the manatee's guts or basically like drink it almost like a, a milkshake. And that slurry helps them to rebuild their gut microbiota. Really cool stuff. It's incredible how much just these little tiny cells can make our immune system work better, can make our digestive systems work better. So just keep all that stuff in mind. So another quick review question, which type of organisms use inorganic chemicals as a source for both energy and carbon? Thinks it's egg. B? It's B. Uh, so remember, we're talking about inorganic chemicals. So chemicals, chemo, autotrophs. They're using the, those inorganic chemicals to generate energy. They're not using the sunlight, they're using like just random chemicals found in a slurry around them. Let's jump into archaea for a bit. Now, many archaea are what we call extremophiles. They love extreme conditions. Extremophiles, lover of extreme conditions, makes sense. Um, members of this domain were first discovered in crazy weird habitats, like the bottoms of hot springs or the bottom of the ocean where you've got these crazy hydrothermal bits going on. That's usually where you're gonna find these things. However, um, as we've kind of gone on, we found where they also tend to exist in other places. But it's incredible some of the weird places they can show up. Places like the salt desert that you see out in, uh, I think it's Utah, where it's just this giant plain of just pure salt. Uh, kind of think of if you're familiar with Star Wars, the eighth movie, even though it's a terrible movie, um, they go to Crate and it has that salt surface. A similar kind of situation. It allows for vehicles to move very, very fast. That's one of the places that Archaea can live that nowhere, no other organisms can. Highly acidic environments. It's just incredible where they can be able to tolerate. Now, ultimately, bacteria and archaea are essential to life. 
prokaryotes live everywhere. They contribute gases to the atmosphere, recycle organic matter, and fix nitrogen. So with all the other species would die out without prokaryotes, as we've kind of been talking about. Now, some bacteria do cause disease. Um, harmful bacteria might be ingested or inhaled, or they can enter the body through wounds or orifices like we were talking about with the manatees. E. coli and salmonella live in things like, uh, they're basically able to really do well with uh, food used for uh, mass food production. So things like ground beef, ground turkey, eggs, uh, a lot of salad mixes and things. Because remember a couple of years ago, there was a huge scare for, um, I believe it was uh, Chipotle where they, had, they weren't washing their lettuce. And so everybody was getting sick with E. coli. So it's not just the meat eaters that are susceptible to it, although there's a, a little bit more of a percentage that are more likely to be affected, or affected by it. And as a result, people were getting really sick and vomiting and had diarrhea associated with it, or the double or the, the dreaded double dragon, if you ever if you know what I'm talking about. That is awful. So, you know, obviously these bacteria exist and they want to continue and re and it's not like they're malicious. They don't think and see, hey, there's a person I should infect them. They're just trying to live, right? So we have to, they're just given an opportunity to colonize a new system. And like I said, humans use prokaryotes all the time. Uh, the natural metabolism helps to make certain foods as well as transgenic bacteria can produce important drugs like, I don't know, insulin, which we used to not be able to produce. And so people that used to have type one diabetes up until the 1950s or 60s would die because we could not artificially produce it. Crazy to think about how far we've come in like 50 years. Um, as well as things like wastewater treatment plants. And if you've ever kept a home aquarium, you probably mess with the you know, life cycle of bacteria to help you be able to foster the right kind of conditions for your animals to live in. Super helpful. Now, eukaryotic cells are a good thing. So they rose somewhere around 1.5 billion years ago. And remember the big difference here is that the uh, eukaryotes have internal membranes that um, basically outside of the cell membrane, they have additional organelles inside of them that have cellular membranes, essentially. Um, and there's a couple of different hypotheses for these. And some of that is like, oh, here's a little pinched off part from the cell that kind of got absorbed in. But I think that kind of the best explanation that we have right now is something called the endosymbiosis theory, which explains the origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts which is where we have evidence that shows that aerobic bacteria and later photosynthet or photosynthetic cyanobacteria took up residence inside of ancient host cells and became eukaryotic. Now, endosymbiosis is a potent force for evolution. So some eukaryotes have chloroplasts with three or four membranes resulting from multiple endosymbiosis events. And what's really interesting is both the chloroplast and the mitochondria have their own separate DNA, which is why we think that this makes the most sense. Now, originally when you're talking about eukaryotes, they started out as single cell, but ultimately they were able to define ways to combine together and form multicellular organisms. Now this was a critical step leading to the evolution of things like plants, animals, fungi, and ultimately each kingdom arose from different lineages of these multicellular protists that are kind of the, that basal form of eukaryotes. So this single-celled green algae called, um, not even gonna try that, uh, shares many similarities with its close relative, the mini-celled volvox, which is kind of like a little algae that's still a protist, but, it, and, but there's not that much of a difference yet. But ultimately, volvox kind of split off and became plants. We're running out of time here, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, now, protists are the simplest of eukaryotes. And because of that, it becomes really difficult to classify them. And it was kind of part of a question on the exam, right? Where if you look at credits, the animals grow up on here, on the animals grow up on a similar branch, which is the same. Are here, and there's still protists that exist that are almost closer, uh, more closely related to archaea than they are to things like animals and plants. It's kind of fascinating in that regard. And ultimately, the only way we could really determine this is based off of DNA. Now, protists are organized into three general groups, um, and they, based off of what they most closely resemble, like how are they living? Are they more plant-like? Are they more animal-like? Are they more fungi-like? So you get the algae, which are resembling of things like plant cells, 
Slime molds and water molds, which resemble more fungal cells, I actually study one of these things um, in our lab and we look at how it kills off frogs. And then you have protozoa, primitive animals. They reserve, resemble a lot of early animal cells. Now algae are considered photosynthetic protists. They're pretty much the only one that can do it. Um, and the algae live in water and carry out photosynthesis. They produce much of the um, oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. It's not trees, it's not grass and everything. It's primarily algae that put out all that photosynthetic oxygen into the world. As well, and are incredibly important to support food webs and the oceans, lakes, rivers, and ponds. Without them, the entire system collapses. Now, gynoflagellates are protists with flagella, uh, characterized by two flagella that usually help them to whirl around things like the ocean, a bunch of other places. Now, some can be photosynthetic, but some are primarily going to be found in things like jellyfish, and some are even bioluminescent, so they light up at night on their own, which is really cool. And they can overgrow and produce toxins, causing things like red tide. I'm sure y'all are quite familiar with that living here in Florida. Then you get the weird ones like biotoms, which are algae, but with unique silica walls. Basically, they have glass walls, right? And these diatoms live in the oceans and small ponds and everything like that. So a huge you know, discrepancy of where they can be found in some sort of water system, where they're the critical source for photosynthesis and food for zooplankton. And their cell walls are very intricate and give them these beautiful shapes. I've seen where people have like done really cool uh, modern art exhibits where they take you know, biologically inspired designs. A lot of that stuff comes from these really cool diatoms. Protists don't have to be, you know, little tiny single-celled organisms. They can be absolutely freaking massive. This is a uh, great example of brown algae. Uh, it's one of the most complex and largest protists, and they form massive kelp beds that can be 30 or 40 feet off of the bottom of the ocean and are incredibly important to support entire communities of life on the Pacific Northwest coast. Things like killer whales, uh, Southern sea otters, a lot of that stuff would not be able to exist where they do without these kinds of systems. So just a simple little protus completely can change an entire ecosystem, which is incredible. Now, red and green algae share many features with plants. Uh, they use the same photosynthetic, or photosynthetic pigments, so, um, and their habitats and body forms are highly diverse. And while they may be unicellular, they can also be uh, colonial or multicellular as well. We're going to skip that. Now, some heterotrophic protists were once classified as fungi, because for a long time we kind of only considered we, we kind of considered that fungi are can be single celled as well, and I think we still do to some extent. Um, and slime molds and water molds, in particular, have these filamentous feeding structures that allow them outwardly that look very much similar to fungi, but they're not quite the same. However, they're very distantly related when it comes to DNA. So even though you can look exactly like something, genetics say that they're quite you know, disparate when it comes to when they exist or how closely related they are. And slime molds in particular are just fascinating organisms. People have messed around with slime molds and done things like just placing little pockets of nu nutrients around a you know, petri plate and watched how the uh, slime mold connected to those nutrients and have been able to map out things like the subway system in Tokyo based off of how the slime mold will connect to these nutrients because it's very similar to how you would want to ideally connect them in the real world. And ultimately, um, they're rather unusual because they can exist as both a single cell or a large mass that behaves like a giant multicellular organism. It's pretty neat. Now, protozoa are the most diverse heterotrophic protists. So, they're going to be the ones that are going to be primarily eating other protists or other bacteria or what have you. And they're grouped together based off of their morphology and how they move around. But many are only distantly related to each other in terms of DNA sequences. So it's kind of a, a grab bag, drunk drawer group, where you just kind of say, we think that they're kind of look like this, but genetically they're not related at all. You have the flagellated protozoa, which are modal, and they Surprise, protozoids that are called flagellated protozoa usually have one or more flagella, which are how they're going to be able to move around. They can live in things like the soil, oceans, freshwater, basically pretty much anywhere. And some are parasites that live in our own body. Great example of this is the amoeboid, which is a uh, protist that produces pseudopodia or false feet. Uh, 
Amoeboid protozoa produce these extensions called pseudopodia, which are important for locomotion and kind of almost move around like if you've ever seen like a starfish or an octopus move around in the ocean, it's very similar kind of movement. And amoebas, amoeboid, probably one of the greatest examples of this that's relevant to y'all is we have the brain-eating amoebas that live in the uh, lakes and rivers around here during the summer that are really active and you usually get about five to 10 cases a year where people will die from them, like getting into your brain's cavity and basically destroying all the tissue in there. Don't go swimming in the middle of the summer unless you wear like earplugs or something, just as a heads up, uh, at least in freshwater. And then you finally get to ciliates, which are complex protozoa. Uh, they have these abundant hair-like structures called cilia, which help to propel them and sweep food into the cell. Now, amphi complexins are non-modal parasites. These include things like malaria, which is caused by plasma, uh, plasmodium, which is ultimately what it's coming from. And people with, for example, one copy of the sickle cell allele are much less likely to contract it because of how the cells or how the alleles interact with each other, which is really fascinating. Definitely something to look into. And we'll talk more about it when we get to the um, respiratory system and the cardiovascular system. Yeah. Sickle cell, not, not celiac, sickle cell. Yeah, so basically what happens is if you have two of the alleles for sickle cell anemia, you get the full blown disease and it can be pretty problematic when it comes to like outdoor exercise and things like that. However, if you're a, a um, heterozygote, which means you have one copy of the normal allele and one copy for sickle cell, that uh, trait allows you to be able to, based off of the way it changes the outside structure of a red blood cell, allows you to be able to avoid plasmodium um, entering your bloodstream and attacking those red blood cells. Oh, it's fascinating, it's cool stuff. Um, finally, we get to fungi, which are kind of the essential decomposers in a system. They're most closely related to animals and plants, even though they outwardly kind of look like plants. And they share many of the same chemical and metabolic features as animals, which allows them to be such great colonizers of animals as far as parasitically goes, being parasitic goes. Things like the worst disease known to science is a fungus. It's a little single-celled fungus called chytrid that burrows into the skin of amphibians and basically will choke out the frog or the salamander by eating through all the keratin and forming scar tissue to the point that the animal can't breathe and dies. It's crazy. Um, somewhere around 30% of all frog species have either gone extinct or endangered directly because of chytrid fungus out of like 6,000 different species. Just crazy. Um, and then you also get, you know, things like ringworm or, which isn't a worm, by the way. Um, uh, tons of really good examples. Things like athlete's foot that seem are relatively harmless, but still are able to colonize your foot and be able to kind of take over the keratin that's present in your skin there. So lots of it, because of the processes and the way that fungi work, they're able to do just as well in humans as they are usually on their own. Now, fungi are an incredibly diverse group that share a very unique set of features. Now, fungi are heterotrophs with external digestion. That means everything is processed outside of their cells and then is brought in. That's what makes them such good uh, kind of recyclers for organic material. Their cell walls are composed of something called chitin. Uh, I believe it's, a, it's kind of similar to cellulose, but a little bit structurally different. Um, their storage carbohydrate is glycogen which is the same as animals. And most are multicellular, although some can be unicellular. It's one of the weird parts about them that make them a little bit more different than your traditional animals or plants. Now, fungi are ultimately, at least for the most part, made up of hyphae which are, and fruiting bodies. So the hyphae are kind of like the roots for the um, fungi itself, which allow them to you know, absorb nutrients, break down materials, that sort of thing. And the fruiting bodies are their reproductive um, parts. So think like a flower for a plant or obviously for other things. Um, and this network of underground filaments called hyphae allow them to absorb all the nutrients they need and collectively these hyphae are called mycelium. Notice there's a crap ton of vocabulary words in this stuff. I wasn't kidding when I said you flashcards are your friend. Um, and ultimately fungi classification is also based off of their reproductive structures. So each fungus phylum makes a different type of spore for sexual reproduction. And so you can generally group them based off of that alone. 
They also have very unique reproductive cycles where um, can live primarily most of their life as a haploid animal. So they don't have their full, or sorry, a haploid organism. So they don't have their full complement of alleles and genes and everything. But then they become diploid very quickly through sexual reproduction, just long enough to be able to recombine genes and then go back to their haploid state. And some plants even do this as well. Uh, fungi interact with a ton of different organisms like we've talked about. Mold um, is a great example of this in particular. Um, and it's not always a bad thing. Um, mold that it showed up on plants, or sorry, mold that showed up on some bread some one day in a random fa uh, factory was ultimately used to create the first antibiotic drug. So it's, it's not always a bad thing per se. And as a result, we use this fungi for medicine, food. Um, I think there's somewhere in the neighborhood of like three to 400 different kinds of like mushrooms actively being cultivated for food production and things like truffles, which are a type of fungus can go for upwards of $10,000, depending on the kind and where you find it, which is just cool. And then you get things like penicillin, like I just mentioned, that was a type of fungus that colonized this, a bunch of leftover bread that somebody left out on a sandwich. And from that, they found that it was able to colonize and kill off bacterial colonies. Cool stuff. Now, of course, some fungi are pathogenic. Uh, another really cool one to point out. Ants or zombie spiders or what have you, where it's a fungus that will go into the brainstem of an organism and take over their entire nervous system and try to get them to first infect as many ants as they possibly can. And then when they're done doing that, it tells them to crawl up onto the stalk of a leaf or something like that, bite down, and that's when the fungus will actually emerge from the animal itself. Really cool stuff. A little creepy, but it's definitely cool to point out. Now, endophytes are a very specialized kind of fungi, live inside plant tissues. And they're, it's a really, it can either be parasitic or it can be um, symbiotic, which means that it's actually beneficial for both the plant and for the fungus. Um, this is in particular something called, um, forget the exact terminology off in my head. You won't need to know it. So, oh, on the next slide. Mycorrhizae, which is a really specialized thing because what it does is it allows plants to basically massively increase their surface area to pull in things like water and other nutrients. And that fungus benefits because it gets some of the new, or some of the sugars and things that are produced through photosynthesis. It's a really cool relationship that, in fact, many plants would be completely screwed if they didn't have it. A lot of beans in particular, things like peanuts, um, lima beans, that kind of stuff are entirely reliant on these mycorrhizal um, things to be able to help them to fix nitrogen and live in nitrogen poor soils. Really cool stuff. And finally, one last group of fungi are the lichens, which they're not quite a fungi. It's kind of this weird combination where they're a um, symbiosis event between green algae or cyanobacteria living amongst the hyphae of a particular fungus. And it allows them to be able to absorb minerals and water while the algal cells will actually produce the sugars needed for photosynthesis. So it's two entirely different clades that have come together to be able to exist together. All right, so we'll get to plants and animals on Wednesday and Friday. Do remember that quiz four is due Sunday, September 19th at 11.59 p.m. If you're one of the 45 students that needs to make up your exam, make sure you do it by Friday.